First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Here, in my hands, I have more computing power than the whole world had when we landed on the moon. I have more computing power than all computers together in the world when we landed on the moon. And this is an extremely powerful machine. Today, those computers are not just in space shuttles or the base station or uh, you don't need large buildings to, to have a computer in there. We have them everywhere. We have them in our homes as a TV, as a Wi-Fi router. We have plenty of them in our cars, in our planes. We uh, carry them around in our pockets or have them on our laps. And some of us even have them inside their bodies, for example, as a hearing aid or directly connected to the heart as a defibrillator. So you can do all those things with one single machine. One single machine which does all those things because it's a general purpose machine. And this machine, we will be able to solve so many problems in the future because it's not limited. We can do everything with it. So there are so many possibilities which we have with this machine. So many things we can do, so many problems humankind can solve with those machines. And even if together we all together sit here and brainstorm about crazy ideas what we can do with that, it will just be a fraction of that what would be possible. When we landed on the moon, people would not have imagined what we would to do today with those computers. The question is, how long will that be true? How long will it be the case that all of us can decide on our own what to do with those computers? Might someone else limit us in, the, in what we can do with these machines? Who will or might limit us in what we are able to do with these powerful machines? Who will control the computers around us? Who will control the computers which might be a danger for us? So today I want to show you how companies slice by slice took away functionality from this machine which in principle could do everything. How they discovered that if they reduce the functionality of the machine that they might have a financial benefit for that. So first I want to give you some examples of what already happened and then I want to share some ideas with you what we can do to counter this and I'm also looking forward to discuss those ideas and your ideas during the conference uh, with you also after the talk. So please if you have something, ideas, come up, talk with me, I'm here for the next two days. So. The first thing, first cut this general purpose machine had is quite obvious for you. Companies made software proprietary. Before, you could do everything with the software. You could use it for any purpose, study the source code, share it with others and improve it. But then they decided to cut those down. So they decided who is allowed to use the software. They decided to limit what you are allowed to do with that software. They decided to limit who is able to learn what all these powerful machines around us are actually doing, how they are functioning. They made it very hard for us to understand how those machines work because they didn't provide the source code. And they also made it difficult for us to share the software with others. So if we solve the problem, or if a problem once was solved by humankind, they didn't allow us to share this with others so that their problems are also solved. And they made it very difficult for us to adopt the software to our own needs. So they limited what we can do with that. They didn't allow us to just make one small modification to the software so it does it the way we want it. They forced us to write the software from scratch or to change our behavior so it fits to the software. So all of that was cutting down what we can do with these machines. There are lots of limitations what we have. Imagine if 
all software out there would be free software, how fast we could solve problems. But in this case, it's slowing us down. The machine is not as powerful as it could be for humankind. The many other of those restrictions which this machine uh, got from, from others was um, is often summarized under the term digital restriction management. So companies invest time to make, uh, to develop functionality which all the users don't want, or most of the users don't want. They invest time to make the machine worse than it was before, to save their business model. So one of the wide, widest known examples is the SIM card block with mobile phones. Everybody on the streets knows about that. So companies invested time to write a program which checks what SIM cards you are putting into your mobile phone. And if this SIM card which perfectly fits in there and the machine could deal with every SIM card from all providers, they check whom it belongs to the SIM card and just allowed it if it's from one provider. So that was not a functionality which people love that much, especially when you're on vacation. And if you have the same product, the, uh, the same phone with or without SIM lock, you would always choose the one without SIM lock if it's for the same price. But they invested time to, to add functionality, which most people don't want, and also thereby limited what the computer else doesn't want, because you cannot just say, uh, don't allow other SIM cards, but you have to add a lot of other restrictions through this computer as well. Most of you probably don't know this notice, because you might use software which ignores it. But when people watch DVDs, they often have these unskippable tracks, one or several of them. And those unskippable tracks, they tell them that they are not allowed to copy the DVD, and they tell them what will happen when you do so. And you cannot say, yes, I heard that, I already saw this notice for 10 times, 100 times, please fast forward, that's not possible. You have to watch it every time. Now the thing is, what would have happened if people wouldn't have seen those notices? What could be the worst thing that happened if people would not see this? They might not know that they are not allowed to copy the DVD. They might not know what the punishment is. Oh, and the fine is $250,000. They might not know this. And Maybe some companies wouldn't have earned so much money. Also, that's questionable. How would that be transferred to other devices? How would something like this look for a car? When I drive with my car and I don't know the rules, I can do much more harm. I can actually kill people. So how would something like this look for a car? Do I have to sit there every time and then the machine tells me you have to drive on the right side, uh, you uh, should not drive as fast in the city as you drive on the highway. Um, when there is a red light, it doesn't mean drive as fast as you can, but stop. And, uh, and then they will tell me all the, the sentences for the different things which you could do. And that every time before I drive to a supermarket. Would that make sense? So you have to do it every time and uh, you couldn't say, okay, I know it. The, the other thing they also did with DVDs was that the companies divided the world into five areas and uh, see, uh, DVDs got a region code and the players got a region code and then you could just play the DVDs in the, with the player from the region code, uh, you bought a, uh, the DVD. So when you were on vacation and you bought a DVD, you couldn't watch it there. But yeah, so the, with music CDs, there were also lots of restrictions what they introduced and attacked our machines. So, one thing which this general purpose computer can do very good is copying. When you have one audio file with one command, 
you can have 10, 100, 1000 or a million without much cost. It's very, very easy. And with the internet, you can make these copies from one place around the world to another. Now you would think that the music industry was very happy when there was a wide distribution of computers and there was, was cheap internet connection and they thought, wow, we don't have to press the CDs anymore and distribute them to our shops. We can directly send it to the people home. But that's not what they thought at that time. They thought, how can we make the computer? How can we make sure that our music files cannot be copied? How can we remove a functionality which this computer is so good at. So what they did was they developed a copy protection for the CDs and added those to the CDs. Problem was that they also implemented in a bad way. So when people bought one of those CDs with old CD players, you often couldn't listen to the music CD. It wasn't working also for car uh, uh, CD uh, players. And um, so when you bought a CD, it was better than if you would go to a, um, if you would download some music files and burn them on your CD yourself. Not really a popular thing. And one big advantage at that time was that the companies, they had to put a label on those CDs. They had to put a label that it's one of those CDs which is restricting what you can do with them. So you can decide not to buy one of those CDs next time. And some companies didn't stop there when it didn't turn out as they expected. Imagine you buy a CD, you go home, put it inside your computer, and then there's a program installed without your knowledge. And this program checks if there are programs executed which could copy the CD. And if it detects one, it kills it. And beside that, it also opens some security holes and slows down your computer. Doesn't seem that uh, interesting, but uh, it's what happened when you gave 20 euros to Sony for buying one of those CDs. They had that for 50 million CDs. And it didn't just stop to attack um, uh, the computers of individuals. In the end, 200,000 computers of uh, governmental and military institutions were affected by that. So they attacked all the machines and removed functionality from those machines just to preserve uh, their business model and to make sure that you cannot copy uh, a CD. Now, um, I'll ask the question because you all have to wait a little bit. Who of you ever lent a book to someone else? Nice. Um, and who of you already sent an email attachment to someone else? It's not that difficult, right? So I was a little bit puzzled when I first read that you can lend books with Amazon eBooks. I thought, well, it's a file. You can copy it. I, it was already possible with other books. It's so easy to send around files. Why is that not possible? It's not possible because Amazon and others made sure that on those ebook readers, they control this platform and take away functionality from us. They control those and make sure that not you are allowed to decide what you can do with this computer, but that they decide what you are allowed to do with this computer. So they decide that you are not allowed to lend a book and just keep it on your reader. And when you want to lend a book, you have to lend all your books, your whole bookshelf. And then after some time, they developed the functionality to do it. But that was all because they first introduced those restrictions. So from those things that you were at, that people, uh, companies were attacking our computers, like with the Sony rootkit, or that they um, added restrictions to um, other devices outside, like the CDs, with the ebook readers, you go deeper. You control the whole computer and make sure that you cannot install another program there to circumvent this. Who of you heard about UEFI Secure Boot? 
Okay. And a trusted platform module, TPM. Okay, so um, it, it will, um, the, the theory. The theory is that, oh, looks different. Uh, the theory is that you have a chain of trust. That you decide in the beginning what operating system your hardware will boot. So it works that um, there are keys in the hardware and um, then you, you check what um, those operating system if it has the right signature with this key and if it has the right signature it will start. So you can make sure that um, I trust uh, the key of my distributor and then it will boot um, the operating system. And if it was manipulated and thereby the, the signature will be changed, it will not boot. So I will, be, um, I will be protected against attackers at this level already. And then this operating system will start and can also check which applications should be on this machine and which applications are allowed to be installed and what, what permissions they have. So I could, for example, I would be warned if Sony tries to install a rootkit on my machine. It will not allow this probably. And I could also make sure to give programs the right permissions to do something with my data or not do it. For example, I could decide to give Amazon the right to download ebooks, and I could also give Amazon's uh, program the right to read uh, those files on my machine so I can read them on, on the computer. But I might not give them the right to delete those. And Oh, that's, that's actually one thing I forgot to, to uh, talk about at the, the book part, that um, they didn't just invent this, but they also removed books later from you. So they, um, they afterwards, when you already bought a book, they deleted those books from all the machines. It happened, for example, with um, uh, George Orwell's 1984. They removed the books from all the readers of the people without anyone knowing it. Or, you couldn't do anything against it. So yeah, you can protect against such threats and you can make sure that uh, your data is protected. Well, that's especially important if the owner of a computer and the user are different people. So when you have to program the software of one of those ATMs, the bank probably doesn't want that the user is allowed to install other programs on these machines. They probably don't want that you are allowed to modify data on this machine without they knowing it. They want to make sure that just trusted people can make modifications to these machines and that you are just allowed to go there, type in your PIN, choose an amount, get the money without installing programs, changing the, the uh, computer's behavior. Because this machine is owned by the bank and not by you. But you are the user of this. So the problem is that the same, the same mechanisms which help to protect the owner of a computer, which help to protect you from, from attackers, can also be used against you as the owner. It can be used against the owner of the computer. You just have to make one small change. You have to make one small change and that's that at the beginning you are not allowed to decide whom to trust at the first step. You are not the person who is allowed to say, I trust this key and I don't trust that key. And at that point, when you are not allowed to do this, the whole thing will change. And then someone else decides which operating system will be uh, running on this machine and which not. Someone else will decide what applications you are allowed to install on this computer and which you are not allowed to install. And someone else will decide what will happen with your data, if it will be removed or not, what you can copy and what you will not be able to copy. All this is then not anymore a chain of trust, but it's a chain of control. Someone else will control you, what you are allowed to do with this. And this is something which is at the moment coming more and more to laptops and desktop computers as well. It was already hardly implemented in uh, gaming consoles, in um, e-book readers, we already had them, or um, uh, tablet and mobile phones, 
but it's coming more and more to the uh, laptops and desktops with those developments in UEFI, Secure Boot, and TPM. So the question is, how do we deal with that? What will we do about it that other people take away control from us as the owners of, of computers and that they decide what we are allowed to do and what we are not allowed to do? That they decide what we are allowed to do with those powerful machines? The first thing is we have to resist. And it's, it's not that, that easy as I say because often you think about why do they do that and how it might be okay. But the, the first crucial thing is that we do not accept this. That we do not accept it in our mind that this is okay to limit this powerful machine. It is not okay that someone else decides what we are allowed to do with our computers. That's not okay. We should not accept it, nobody should accept it, and we have to do something against it. And one thing is, in your mind already, don't accept that this is a normal condition. It's not good for our society, so we should not accept it. But I guess you want to do a little bit more. And all of you already do more because you are here. And so all of you already use free software. You probably also check out how free software works. You develop it further, you share it with others. In your community, you help others to also use free software, introduce them to it. You help them to understand how software works, that they can participate there. You make translations so that more people are um, able to use the software. You, you share the software with others and show them, hey, you can also do this. And you help people to make the computer work in a way which fits their needs. Help them to make modifications so they can use computers in a way they want. So that's a big contribution to preserve this, the power of this tool, of this computer. It's a very important task. And we all have to continue doing this because the software is the heart of all these machines. And we have to make sure that people can control this. Other more specific things for, uh, to take control about the machine itself is help us that we preserve the right to tinker, or that we get it in some legislations. We should be always legally allowed to change the hardware we own. We should always be legally allowed to install software on our own computers without anyone else having to give us permission for that. We have to fight for this. Second thing you saw with the CDs, we have, you can help to, to make it uh, sure that those devices which have restrictions, that they are labeled, that they have to tell you what restrictions they have, that the normal condition is a general purpose computer and when they restrict what you can do with that, that they have to tell you what you are not allowed to do with it. That someone else can delete your data, that someone else uh, can in, uh, put data on it, that you are not allowed to install other applications, that you are not allowed to do, uh, technically it's, it's not possible to install another operating system and so on. That should be on a label and so you can make an, a decision what you want to buy and what not. And the other is help to make good specifications. Like the with uh, Trusted computing with uh, the TPMs and UEFI Secure Boot, we saw more and more that they were developed in a way that, like TPM version 1.2, was still written in a way that they protect the owner, that the owner has the control. And now, with the drafts for version 2.0, it takes away this control and gives it to the vendors. And that's something we have to monitor closely and we have to make sure that all specifications in these areas that they make sure that the owner of a, of a hardware is the one who will, has the control over that and who decides what he can do with that or what not, and not someone else. So we have to monitor what specifications, how they develop. It, it, will, not be, it will not happen that at one point there's a big step and then all those specifications say, and the owner should not have the control. It's slice by slice, and it's going one step after another. 
and with UEFI and, and uh, the TPMs we see this that it's going in this direction. And when it was easy in the uh, um, long time ago, it was very difficult to install GNU Linux on, on a laptop you bought. But uh, we got better and better with that. So in future, and we already see that now it will, it's getting more and more complicated to install GNU Linux on laptops or desktop computers because of that. But it is something, those are all, all things which are already on a, on a very high level. Like if you want to encourage someone to also develop uh, um, free software programs, come here to Academy or um, look at those specifications and evaluate them, that's, that's a lot of effort probably. And not all people can spend so much time on that. Can you read that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so it's important that we think about ways for more people to participate in this movement. We have to find easy ways to help, to, to do one part. And um, so I want to share a few of them on brainstorm a little bit and I hope that afterwards during the conference you can come up with your own ideas. So just one, some, some ideas what, what I see around me, what, what people are doing, where it often depends, you, you just need a few minutes a week or a few minutes a month. One thing is um, when people send you um, uh, docx attachments, you write back to them and tell them, no, I don't want to have this. Can you please send it as an ODT? Very small thing and uh, depending on how the relationship is, like if someone else wants something from you, it's easier. If it's your boss, it might be more difficult. Some people might not do it with their boss, that's okay. Some people might do it with their boss, that's better. But it's, it's always something which how comfortable people are, they can do something and it's one small step. The, the other thing is like, for example, talk about those things with politicians. Politicians, they, they get all kind of crazy ideas from, from other people. They discuss with them about topics which are, you cannot imagine what they have to deal with. So you don't have to be shy to talk with them about software freedom. Go there, talk with them. Maybe it's once 15 minutes. That's okay. That's 15 minutes in a year where you go to a politician and talk with them about it. At that point, you might still think, oh, what a freak. Uh, but when there is a fifth person, they might think, oh, hmm, assistant, please research what this is about. There are things like, um, sometimes we are too smart. So we already know before which shops sell free software uh, in, on their hardware. And um, we already know which, which computers we can use for that. And we don't ask. Other people go to a shop and say, can I have this and this device? And they say no. And then other people also go there and then the shops after some time changes it. So for example, in, in the past, when I was at an electronic shop, I always, when I had like three minutes to spare, I asked the staff, do you have any machines with free software pre-installed? And then depending on my time, I either said, um, when they said no, I either discussed with them why I would like to have this or when I didn't have time, I just walked away with a very sad face and again, it's something one person does it, not that much will happen, lots of people do it, there will be a change probably and it's something which doesn't cost you a lot of money to do this and ask there, it's a few minutes and even if you just do this once a year, that's fine. The, the other thing is that like sometimes when companies sell free software on their devices, we, we should support them and it's something where it's very easy to say to your friends, buy this laptop there, it's pre-installed, yes, it's a little bit more expensive, but you support something good please don't buy it there for 50 bucks less and then uh, ask me to help you to install it there. Encourage your friends to buy laptops which are pre-installed with free software if it somehow works. 
also other uh, like tablets and, and other devices. Try to give money to those who value your freedom and give as little as possible to companies who take away your freedoms. So that's something important. Don't be a person who tries to, oh, but I want to save these last bucks just to, to have it a little bit cheaper. If you can afford it, support the people who develop free software. Another thing which is also a very small thing to do, show that you are part of this movement. Show others that you, that you are part of this. Like when you wear a t-shirt, you have a pin, uh, you put some posters in, in your office. Uh, those are all small things which show others around you that you are working for the sa same thing. That you are part of the same movement. And it's, it's something you should not underestimate. Like um, when I once walked around my neighborhood and then I saw someone with a Hacking for Freedom t-shirt and I didn't know that person. That's motivating because there are others around me who believe in the same things. It's uh, in some companies, they, when, when they see posters, oh, there's someone who thinks the same as I do. And so also, uh, like when I was here at the, at the airport, uh, someone was looking at my t-shirt and I thought, oh, you're also going to academy? And uh, so that's how you meet people who think the same. So use this, show others that you, that you also support it. And like once, I was wearing the same t-shirt here in a, in a Berlin subway, someone came, I'm also using KDE, and he was very happy. So, yeah, and that's a very small thing. Even if you don't change anything else, show that you do that. Put it on your laptop so other people see what you think about. And one other small thing everybody can do is, and it, which also takes very little time, say thank you to the others. In the free software community, we often, we just tell people, oh, there is this bug there, I want this feature, and they complain, and they discuss how to do something better, and we often forget to say thank you. And that's something which is also motivating for others, and you can help with this, um, um, with this movement to support it by saying thank you. And even if you just do it once a year, for example, at the I Love Free Software Day on the 14th of February, that's something which helps. 10 minutes a year, which helps. So my point is that we have to find new ways, very, very small things people can do, things they can easily do, and which are not, uh, we, we, from our expectations, they are not so high that we, we expect them to do the same thing we do, but that we give them easy things they can do, do in a few minutes. And every person, and every small activity counts there. And there are still many people around the world who don't benefit from fundamental freedoms, like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, privacy, or other freedoms we take as granted. They have to fight for them every day. And once you have them, it doesn't stop there. We have to defend all our freedoms again and again. As a society, we have to defend those. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not something we have it once and then it's there for all. And as our world today consists of so many computers around us and they are, have so, such a dominant position, we also need to fight and we need to protect software freedom and the right to control our technology. So. Thank you, and uh, thank you for listening, and thank you all for contributing to Free Software. Thank you for joining us. Do we have questions for Matthias? I think we still have two, three minutes. Thank you, Matthias. All right. <laughs> Good investment. <laughs> Hello. So, what do you think about this current makers movement and the, the new small hardware appearing everywhere? People are doing everything, basically. So, the question was what I think about makers? The makers movement, like the Raspberry Pi and the Banana Pi and all this small hardware that people are using for everything, like Arduino. Yeah. Th those are very important. I mean, uh, 
I don't want that all the other computers out there uh, are not, that, that we lose the possibility there to use them as general purpose computers. But if it comes to the worst, those might be our last defense lines. And it's important that we don't just control the, the, the software, but as I said, that we are also allowed to modify the hardware. Our own hardware, we should not be limited by someone else that we, are, that we can modify it and adopt it to our needs. So those movements are very important and they very nice fit together with the, with the free software movement. Yeah, I hope they continue and are such successful as the free software movement have been before. How strong or how powerful is the Microsoft and Google and Facebook lobby in Europe? I guess in the, in the free software you, mm -hmm. you fight against that. How strong are they? Well, they have a much larger budget than, for example, Free Software Foundation Europe. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, first of all, sometimes it's, it's not that we fight them. It's meanwhile, it's more complex. So Microsoft, they are now also developing free software in some parts. Um, they, they are providing free software installations uh, where you can buy the service from them. Google, they also do a lot of free software things. So in some parts there are joint goals, in others there are different goals. So, and yes, it's difficult when you have different goals to, uh, to, um, to counter those on a political level. They have so many people in Brussels to do lobbying there. Um, look at the last numbers whom, for example, uh, uh, Oettinger is, um, is meeting with. And you see, okay, there's people from Google, Microsoft all the time there. And I can tell you that FSFE didn't have a meeting yet with him. So it's difficult there. But on the other hand, we are many. We are a lot of people. And a lot of people from us, they don't do it in their paid time, but we do it as volunteers. And so I think it's, it's something which in the long run, uh, in the short term, they are always more powerful. But when you look uh, at the development for a long time, I think it's, it's on our side that they slowly develop into our direction. And it's more going in this direction that we, uh, that they adopt free software and that they use more of disadvantages. But it's something we have to, of course, we have to invest to make sure that, that we can still protect that. We, ha we have to do all those small steps. And if all of you do this and all of you convince others to do some of those small steps, I don't think that uh, an employee from Microsoft or, or Google can convince people about their position, uh, can, can convince people around them about their positions. That's something you, um, you do when you're paid for it. More and more parts of modern computers have their own processors and their own uh, firmware, which is uh, mostly proprietary software. And if you buy a computer, um, I mean the SSD, for example, or the graphics cards, they have their own firmware. How do you deal with that? How should we do deal with that? Hmm. I mean, the, before that, it was very easy. Uh, way to say like hardware operating system. There are many layers between and we have to, to work on those layers too. We have to make sure that we control the bias, things like uh, core boot or libre boot. We should make sure that we can change the firmware of, of, um, of different, uh, different hardware and if you are not able to do this we will lose a, a strong part. So, yeah, we have to invest resources into this, that this is also free software. Hi. In many cases, the software we run uh, is actually not running on our own computer anymore, but on the computer 
computer of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we share the computer of the service provider with many other people and that uh, brings us tremendously useful mm -hmm. services. So the, our interest to control the software gets into conflict with the, the interest mm -hmm. of the owner of the computer and also other users of this computer. So how do you think, can this conflict be resolved without giving up software freedom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually, could be a whole talk. Um, so I, I concentrate here on, on the part of controllability of our own computers. The thing you mentioned is that more and more is moving to others' computers, like... Uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to have some stickers, I have some with me as well in this bag, so... Yeah. Um, we have to find solutions for this as well, but it's a little bit more complicated. Like how can you make sure that you are, for example, allowed to run modified versions on someone else's computer as well, so that you have similar rights and it would be your own computer. How can we make sure that we can move our data to, to other providers um, without losing any control over them? So there are many things there like, um, I think that the user data manifesto, for example, is a very good way forward with this. There are many, many questions which are still open there. The, why I was highlighting this was that it's important that we also own some computers. Some of those computers belong to us, so that we are always able to have those last computers at least to perform some something some of our tasks in, in a way actually we on our own do and we don't depend on anyone else and by owning a device that's that's actually a very good step to to do this so it's but it's two things we need both because many of the things uh, which which is done on other people's computers they are so powerful we cannot have those computers at home and yeah I would remark to that. Maybe if it weren't so hard to run the server, more people could do it themselves. Yep. 